Okay. So, let us look at an example of calculating the eigenvalues and vectors of a matrix. Let us say you are given the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, minus 4, 1, 2, 3. So, if you are given this matrix A is equal to this, this matrix, let us see how we will calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, in order to calculate the, the eigenvalues, what we said is that we replace the diagonal elements by 1 minus lambda, leave the off diagonal elements as they are. and we take the determinant of this matrix and we set it equal to 0. So, when we solve this, you will get a cubic equation in lambda and when you solve this, you will get 3 roots corresponding to the 3 eigenvalues of lambda. So, if you work this out, the cubic equation has roots 1 minus lambda. So, the, so the determinant will have only one term, only one row contributes. 2 minus lambda into 3 minus lambda minus 2 into minus 4 equal to 0. Okay. And straight away you can see that lambda equal to 1 is one eigenvalue. So, lambda equal to 1. Okay. And uh, the other two eigenvalues are given by the solutions of this equation. So, when you set this term to 0, you will get two more eigenvalues. So, let us work that out. So, this gives you lambda square minus phi lambda plus 6 plus 8. And uh, this you can show that it is equal to, so you can show that this is equal to lambda square minus phi lambda plus 14. And, uh, and when you solve this, you will get lambda equal to 5 plus or minus square root of, okay. so 5 plus minus square root of 25 minus 14 into 4, 14 into 4 is 56 divided by 2 a, a in this case is just 2. Okay, so these are the so so we get one, we get the second, and we get the third eigenvalue. So if you work this out, this comes to twenty-five minus fifty-six is minus thirty-one. So thirty-one i. So lambda equal to phi plus minus root minus thirty-one by two. Okay. So this root is an imaginary root. So lambda equal to one or lambda equal to 5 plus root 31 into i by 2 or lambda equal to 5 minus root 31 i by 2, okay, where i is square root of minus 1. Okay. So, this gives the 3 eigenvalues and uh, given these 3 eigenvalues, we can work out the 3 eigenvectors. Uh, the, uh, in order to solve for the eigenvectors, I will solve for the eigenvector when lambda equal to 1. So, for lambda equal to 1, the eigenvector is given by, so you substitute 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, minus 4, 1, 2, 3. This is A. If this eigenvalue has, so so, let the eigenvalue be x1, x2, x3 and this has to be equal to 1. So, 1 times x1, x2, x3. Okay. So, that implies, so the first, first equation will give you x1 equal to x1, second equation will give you x 1 plus 2 x 2 minus 4 x 3 is equal to x 2 and the third equation will give you x 1 plus 2 x 2 
plus 3 x 3 equal to a x 3. Okay. Now, uh, turns out that you cannot determine x 1 uniquely. So, so the eigenvalues, we, uh, the eigenvectors we had already said that they can be determined only up to a constant. Okay. So, let us choose x 1 equal to 1 for convenience. Okay. So, we just choose x 1 equal to 1 and then what we are left with is two equations. The first equation if I rearrange it, we will get x 2 minus 4 x 3 is equal to minus 1 and the next equation will give me 2 x 2 plus 2 x 3 equal to minus 1. Okay. So, these are the two equations and you can solve these for x 2 and x 3 and uh, you can easily see that uh, if I had twice this 5 x 2 is equal to minus 3 implies x 2 equal to minus 3 by 5 and uh, if x 2 is minus 3 by 5 then you can show that uh, minus 6 by 5. So, this is 1 by 10 to 1 by 10. Okay. So, x 3 has to be 1 by 10 then this minus 3 by 5 and uh, 1 by 10 into minus 4 will give you minus 4 by 10 that is minus 2 by 5. So, so it, the, they add up to give you minus 5. So, the eigenvector is 1 minus 3 by 5 and 1 by 10. Okay. So, corresponding to eigenvalue 1 your eigenvector is 1 minus 3 uh, minus 3 by 5 and 1 by 10. And uh, in this way, you can calculate the remaining two eigenvalues also. Okay. Next, uh, now uh, in the last part of, of the discussion on matrices, we will discuss a few special kinds of matrices. And uh, the kinds of special matrices we will be talking about are uh, they have special properties. Okay. So, the first, first kind of matrix is what is called an orthogonal matrix. This is related to what we had talked about earlier about the rotation matrices. If you remember at that time we had said that the matrix of rotations we had described a matrix which describes rotation of a vector in three dimensions and rotation is an operation that preserves the length of the vector. Okay. So, an orthogonal matrix is a matrix that preserves length of any vector that it transforms. Okay. Now, we can think of length for a three dimensional vector, but uh, however, if you go to higher dimensions then the meaning of length of a, of a vector might not always be clear. So, so uh, we we'll look at the we we'll look at the mathematical definition of the of an orthogonal matrix. So an orthogonal matrix is a matrix. So A, if A is orthogonal, if A is an orthogonal matrix, then the transpose of A is equal to it is inverse. Okay. So, this is the definition of the orthogonal matrix. Okay. So, so, you take the transpose of A, it is the same as the inverse of A. In other words, in other words, if you take if you take A and multiply it by A transpose, you will get the identity matrix. Okay. So, if you multiply A by A transpose, you will get nothing but the identity matrix. So, next we will discuss a few special matrices and uh, these special matrices are matrices that are often used in many applications and uh, they are special because the matrix satisfies certain properties. So, the first kind of special matrix that we will be talking about here are what are called as orthogonal matrices. Okay. 
Now, uh, orthogonal matrices can be thought of as uh, as as matrices that are that represent rotations. And uh, this is in the following sense: when we had discussed when we had discussed the matrix of rotations, what we had said is that uh, if you had a vector in one coordinate frame. Now, uh, if this vector was v, when you rotated it by some angle about some axis, let us say you rotated by theta about the z axis and you got a vector v prime, okay. then you could represent v prime as a matrix multiplied multiplying v and that matrix was called a rotation matrix. Okay. So, we had a matrix which we called r z theta. Theta as the rotation matrix. And the rotation matrix had a property that any uh, the, that the rotation operation preserves the length of the vector. So, the length of the vector was unchanged even though the components of the vector changed after rotation. So, an orthogonal matrix is a general matrix that preserves the length of the of a vector. So, it preserves length. Okay. So, so the way now, now, now we are mainly thinking in terms of, of, of a matrix as, uh, as an object that transforms a vector into another vector and an orthogonal matrix is a matrix that preserves the length of the vector before and, and after the transformation. Now, we are, the, the idea of length is something that makes sense when we are talking about uh, when we are talking about vectors pointing in space. So, for two dimensions or three dimensions we can talk about length of vectors, but uh, if we have if we have vectors staying in other dimensions then uh, we need a more general definition of the term orthogonal. So, the general definition of orthogonal is the following a matrix A is said to be orthogonal if A transpose equal to A inverse. Okay. So, the inverse of A is same as the transpose of A and if a matrix satisfies this property then uh, you can easily show that uh, that when it transforms a vector it will preserve the length of the vector okay so so we'll show that in a minute let's uh, so this preserves the length and the way to see that is the following you suppose you had uh, So, suppose you had a vector a, a vector x okay, and you had this matrix a, okay. then the length of x, length of x is given by x transpose x. Okay. So, so, you pre multiply by the transpose. So, so x trans, so if x is, if x is a vector that is, that has various components x 1, y 1, z 1. So, if x vector is this, okay. then x transpose is equal to x 1, y 1, z 1. And if you do x transpose x, you get nothing but the dot product. So, x transpose x x 1 square plus y 1 square plus z 1 square. So, the length of x is x transpose x. Okay. Now, now uh, if, when you transform the vector, you will get a times x and the length of a times x is equal to 
A x transpose A x okay. and this is same as A x transpose is x transpose A transpose. So, the, the transpose of a product of two matrices is a product of the transposes in the opposite direction okay. and A x. So, I write A x in this form and now if the matrix is orthogonal A transpose A equal to identity okay. So, so A transpose equal to A inverse and therefore, A transpose multiplied by A is nothing but the identity matrix. So, then the length of A x is equal to x transpose identity x. So, x transpose x. So, equal to length of x. Okay. So, so we showed that the, the matrix A, if it is orthogonal, it will preserve the length of the vector and vice versa, if it preserves the length of the vector, then the matrix A is called an orthogonal matrix. Okay. Now, uh, we notice that a transpose A is identity. So, A transpose A equal to identity. Okay. So, now, now A transpose into A is a matrix. The elements of A transpose A are, so the elements of of A transpose A. Okay. So, so if they are called, so these elements are given by sum over k, okay. a, so a k i, a k j. Okay. So, if you take a transpose a, if you, if I had, if I had a times a, then it would be a i k a k j, but now instead of a, I have a transpose. So, I have to take a k i. A k i times A k j. Okay. So, that means, uh, if the i jth element, this is the i jth element is equal to this. Okay. So, the i jth element of this A, tr a transpose A is given by A k i A k j, sum over k. Okay. Now, it is instructive to look at what this means. So, A this is A 1 and A trans. So, so, so this is A and A transpose is given by And now, if you take the, if you take the elements of this product, what it means is, you take one row. Uh, if you, if you want to, if you want to calculate the, if you want to calculate this element, okay. If you want to calculate the one one tel element, then you take the first row and multiply it by the first column. So that is a one one a one one plus a one two a one two plus a one three a one three. Okay. So this the so what this means is that it means so the first element is given by a11 a11 plus a12 a12 plus a13 a13 okay and this is equal to a11 square plus a12 square plus a 1 3 square and uh, so the sum of squares of 
elements of any row this has to be this is a diagonal element and this has to be equal to 1. So, the first element of this product is a 1 1 into a 1 1 plus a 1 2 into a 1 2 plus a 1 3 into a 1 3. So, a 1 1 square plus a 1 2 square plus a 1 3 square it has to be equal to 1. Similarly, if I take the the 2 2 element of that I will get a 2 1 a 2 1 a 2 2 a 2 2 a 2 3 a 2 3. So, so similarly a 2 1 square plus a 2 2 square plus a 2 3 square is equal to 1 and you can also show the same for a 3 1 square plus a 3 2 square plus a 3 3 square has to be equal to 1. So, if the matrix is orthogonal then the sum of elements of any row have to add up to 1 and you can also show that the sum of elements of any column have to add up to 1. So, the, uh, the, the sum of squares of elements of any row or column have to add up to 1. Secondly, now, now if I take the 1 2 element, okay, if I take the 1 2 element, so a 1 1 into a, a 2 1, a 2 a 1 2 into a 2 2, a 1 3 into a 2 3 and if you notice this is a 1 1 into a 2 1, okay, so a 1 1, a 2 1, a 2 1 comes here. So, it is pr product of these two. Similarly, it is a product the next element is a product of these two and the third element is a product of these two. Okay. So, that means you take a dot product of any two rows, if you take a dot product of any two rows you should get 0. Okay. So, an orthogonal matrix okay, you should get 0 because all the all the off diagonal elements of the product of these two matrices is 0. Okay. So, an orthogonal matrix has a property that if you take a dot product of a row with itself you will get 1 and if you take a dot product of any two rows you will get 0. Okay. So, that is the property of the orthogonal matrix. Okay. So, so, so far we have seen that an orthogonal matrix is given by is given by a a transpose equal to a inverse. Okay. Now, if the matrix a is a uh, has complex numbers some of its uh, elements if some of the elements of a matrix are complex. So, this is useful for real matrices for complex matrices the useful definition it is it is not just the transpose that is useful. So, instead of transpose we use something called a Hermitian conjugate which is which is represented by a dagger okay. and uh, this dagger is basically a transpose followed by a complex conjugate. Okay. So, so this is a complex conjugate okay. So, you first take the transpose of the matrix and then you take the complex conjugate of every element in the matrix. Okay. So, for complex conjugates the the equivalent of orthogonal matrices are called unitary matrices. And a unitary matrix has has a property that the complex conjugate is equal to the to its inverse. Okay. So, uh, just as for real matrices the interesting matrices are the ones who which are orthogonal with because they preserve the length for a complex matrix okay it is a unitary matrix that is uh, interesting because in this case the length is always defined with a complex conjugate. Now, there are some other other special matrices that we will just mention for completeness uh, and, and, and we will always mention the the real matrix and the and the and the equivalent for complex matrices. So, so I'll just I'll just erase this here, and we'll just note that this dagger refers to complex conjugate, or conjugate. Uh, it's it's actually the Hermitian conjugate. So it's a transpose and a conjugate. Okay. So the next uh, we'll define what is called a symmetric matrix. And a symmetric matrix is one for which a transpose equal to a. Okay, so, so, the off diagonal elements are equal to each other. 
Okay. And for complex conjugate, instead of symmetric matrices, we use Hermitian matrices. And for a Hermitian matrix, the the conjugate transpose is equal to the matrix. Okay. So so the elements of the of the uh, the the diagonal elements will be real, and the off diagonal elements will be complex conjugates of each other. Okay. So an example of a Hermitian matrix. So diagonal elements have to be real. And then So you notice that the diagonal elements will all be real, and the off-diagonal elements will be complex conjugates of each other. Okay, so the so they'll be complex conjugates of the corresponding off-diagonal element. Okay, then uh, just as you have symmetric matrices, you could also have an anti-symmetric matrix. Anti-symmetric matrix, and in that case, A transpose equal to minus A. Okay, so the so the off diagonal elements are my are, are uh, they are related to each other by minus signs and in this case you have an uh, skew hermitian so a skew hermitian matrix a dagger equal to minus a so these are some of the special matrices that appear Often in uh, various discussions of matrices, especially when we are, uh, especially in quantum chemistry, you, we do lot of lot of operations involving matrices, and it's uh, it's very important to know what these operations do, and uh, these are various matrices that that have certain special properties. Now, uh, one application of these matrices is in what is called as a similarity transformation. So, so if you have a matrix A, okay, and uh, you define a matrix A tilde, which is related to A by B A, B inverse. Okay. So, if if a matrix A tilde is related to A by this op by this operation, so you so you first multiply by by the matrix, and then you multiply by its inverse. Okay, but you don't multiply them together; you multiply them on either sides. Okay. Then you say that A tilde is similar to A, okay. and uh, this has uh, this has certain implications on uh, relation between these two matrices. Okay. What is uh, what is of interest to us is that uh, this this is a way of uh, of uh, Transforming vectors from one coordinates to other. Okay, so the similarity transformation plays a role in transforming vectors from one coordinate to other, and and it plays a role in the following way. Suppose uh, suppose you have uh, you suppose okay, so so suppose you have a vector v. Okay. And you operate it by a, and you get a vector v1. Okay, so so in one coordinate system, so in the in one coordinate system, you operate you operate uh, by a on v, and you get v1. Okay, and uh, a need not be an orthogonal matrix, anything. It's just some operation that converts v to v1. Okay, and uh, these are defined in this coordinate system. And now, now if you imagine that you that you transform the coordinates to some other coordinates, is, so you so you operate by b, and this transforms the vectors into a new coordinate system. Okay, so uh, so in the new coordinate system, 
you have you have BV. So, V goes to BV and uh, V1 goes to BV1. Okay. Then uh, what is the relation between these two? How are how are BV how are BV1 and BV related in the new coordinate system? So, so what is this? What is this quantity that appears here? Okay. So, that is a question we will ask. And, uh, and what we will find is that is that the quantity that appears here is nothing but a tilde. Okay. So, what so, uh, so in order to answer this question we start with v 1 equal to a v. Okay. Now, b v 1 equal to b a v okay. and uh, this is equal to b a b inverse into b v. Okay, so, I put a b inverse b here and so, this is equal to a tilde into b v. Okay. So, the relation v 1 equal to equal to a v okay, becomes b v 1 equal to a tilde b v. Okay. So, in the new coordinate system, in the new coordinate system if I call this uh, if I call this v 1 prime. So, if v 1 goes to v 1 prime, v goes to v goes to v prime okay, then a a will transform to a tilde. Okay. So, that the relation between v v 1 and v is maintained. Okay. So, so, in a way in a way where this is the way a matrix transforms when you transform the coordinates. So, just as the vectors transform when you transform the coordinates, the matrix A also gets transformed in the new coordinate system and the way it transforms is through this similarity transformation. Okay. Now, if B is a is an orthogonal matrix, then, then you can uh, then B inverse can be replaced by B transpose okay, and you have the corresponding similarity transformation. Okay. Similarly, if uh, if you are dealing with complex matrices, you can define uh, transformation by a huge, by a unitary matrix and and so on. Okay. And uh, these are these are various tools that are used in the, in the many many areas of matrix of uh, matrix algebra. Okay. They are often useful ways to to diagonalize matrices. That is in that is in other words to calculate its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay. So, you can use the similarity transformations are often used. We will not uh, go into that in too much detail. Uh, in the next class, we will discuss an application of all the matrix methods and the applications that the application that we will discuss is, uh, is related to molecular orbital theory and in particular a kind of molecular orbital theory called the Huckel molecular orbital theory. We have seen so far how to solve first order differential equations and the strategy that we said is to first try to separate variables. Then if you are not able to separate the variables, then you try to see if this can be formulated as an exact differential and then if you are not able to formulate it as an exact differential, then you try to look for integration factors and typically integration factors that depend only on one variable which can be either x the independent variable or y the dependent variable and uh, then using all these techniques you can get you can solve a large number of first order differential equations. Okay. Now, uh, sometimes in many real problems you have not a single differential equation, but you have a whole a whole set of differential equations. Okay, involving di involving different variables. For example, suppose you have the variables y 1 which is a function of time and y 2 which is function of time. So, these are two variables Okay, so, these are two variables both of them are functions of some parameter t I, I, I said time, but this is just a parameter. It could have been x I could have called it x or anything else, but essentially the physical problem consists of 
two variables that are functions of one variable. Okay. So, in such a case, uh, you might have differential equations for each of these variables. So, you could have dy 1 by dt is equal to some function of y 1, y 2 and t and some function of Okay, so both y1, uh, both dy1 by dt is some function of y1, y2t, and this is some other function of y1, y2t. Okay, so these are two different functions, and such situations are very commonly encountered. And uh, if this function of y1, y2t contains y2 in it, then you say that the two equations are coupled to each other. So, for example. This is a sim th this is one simple example where d y 1 by d t has two terms, one is proportional to y 1 and the other is proportional to y 2. Okay, so, c 1 1, c 1 2, c 2 1 and c 2 2 are constants and this is one example of a system of differential equations. So, this is an a system of I would say linear differential equations. And I say linear because uh, the, the terms in y 1 are, are proportional to y 1 or y 2. Okay? So, you only have linear terms. You could have constant also. In addition to this, you could also have a constant. So, for example, you could also have plus d 1 d 2. Okay? So, these are the, the, this is an example of a system of linear differential equations. It is a and uh, I showed only two equations, but you could have a whole you could have a very large system of linear differential equations. For example, you could have d y 1 by d t is equal to something and so on. Okay, you could have a whole whole set of uh, whole set of differential equations and uh, they could either be linear as in this case or they could be some other more complicated functions. And these are these are commonly encountered in many physical problems. Okay. Now, uh, one thing to note is the following that uh, it is possible to write a second order differential equation as uh, system of first order differential equations. Okay. So, the idea is the following, suppose I had a second order, let us take an example, be, suppose I had d square y true by d t square is equal to and say c 1 d y by d t c 2 y plus d 1. Okay, suppose I had I had a I had a second order this is a second order differential equation it involves second derivative of y first derivative of y y and a constant term. Okay. Now, uh, you can write this as a as a system of differential equations if you if you use the following idea. So, you use y is equal to y 1 and d y by d t is equal to y 2. Okay. 
So now, now instead of y, you use y1 and y2 and you use it in, a, in, the, in the following way. You say that uh, the first equation you will say you will say uh, d y 1 by d t is equal to 0 times y 1 plus y 2 plus 0. Okay. I am just I am just putting the zeros just to make connection with this with this sort of expression. Okay. So, d y 1 by according to this according to this d y by d t is y 2. In other words, since y is y 1, you write d y 1 by d t is equal to y 2. The second equation is you have uh, d square y by d t square that is same as d by d t of d y by d t d y by d t of y 2. So, I write this as d by d t of y 2 and this is equal to now you had c 1 now d y by d t I write as y 2. plus c 2 y I write as y 1 plus d 1. Okay. Now, you can see that this is clearly in the form of two coupled coupled first order differential equations. Okay. So, so we wrote a second order differential equation in the form of two coupled first order differential equations or you, or you wrote it as a system of two, two uh, first order differential equations. Okay. So, so, uh, what is the advantage of doing this? And uh, the advantage of doing this will be particularly seen when we look at linear first order differential equations. So, so when we look at linear differential equations, okay, so we will take the example of a set of linear coupled first order differential equations. So, let us look at a set of linear coupled first order differential equations. We will start with a simple example just to illustrate the use of this technique, but uh, you can extend this to various other, other uh, systems also. So, let us take the example of uh, and, and I will just, just for illustration, I will just take uh, two coupled differential equations, but you can extend this to as many variables as is necessary to solve your problem. So, let us take the example you have d y 1 by d t equal to c 1 1 y 1 y 2 and d y 2 by d t is equal to c 2 1 y 1 c 2 2 y 2. Okay. So, uh, I deliberately wrote the variables in this form, so, so that you might be able to see some, some connection. Okay. Now, if you look at the right hand side, c 1 1 y 1 plus c 1 2 y 2 and c 2 1 y 1 plus c 2 2 y 2. Okay. So, uh, so what we will do is uh, we will we'll write this we will write this set of coupled equations in the following form. The left hand side we will write it as so we will write it as a as a two component vector the first component is d y 1 by d t, the second component is d y 2 by d t and then the right hand side is also a two component vector, these are the two components, but instead of writing it in this form, we will write it as c 1 1 okay. So, so we write it as a, as a matrix multiplying y 1 and y 2. Okay. So, 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 the advantage of writing in this form will become cl clear in a few minutes. So, we, so we wrote these, this set of two equations, we wrote it in this matrix in this vector form. Okay. Now, uh, I can call this vector, I can call this as a vector y okay, or, or rather I will start by calling this as y, then this vector is d by d t of y. Okay. So, so this vector is d by d t of y okay. and I will call, call this matrix as C. Okay. 
so then you can write your you can write your set of equations in the form cy okay so your set of uh, two differential equations we wrote in this form as d d in in way in vector notation so dy by dt is c times y where y is a vector that has two components okay now you can you can extend this to any number of different equations okay the the important thing is that each term should be uh, should be linear in one of the coefficients okay you can also extend this to the case where in addition to the in a, in addition to terms that are linear in the coefficients you also have a constant okay and we'll see that in a minute so so suppose you had suppose you had dy1 by dt is equal to c11 y1 c12 y2 plus d1 and you had c21 y1 plus d2 if you had if you had these two equations then you would write this as you would you would call you would call this me you would say that uh, d is equal to d1 d2 then you can write this whole thing as dy by dt is equal to c times y plus d this is the most general way of writing a system of linear differential equations okay so a system of linear differential equations uh, system of linear first order differential equations is written in this form okay and uh, and uh, this is this is probably one of the most uh, most used uh, problems in in many engineering and scientific applications okay i'll just mention briefly how you can use some techniques from from matrix algebra to to solve this system of linear first order differential equations okay so let's start with our set of linear first order differential equations of the form dy by dt is equal to cy i'll just start with cy but 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 uh, to illustrate uh, what we are going to show but you can extend it to you can extend it to other problems okay now uh, in order to motivate the solution i'll say that suppose suppose y was just a scalar suppose y was just a scalar and c was just a constant okay so suppose y was a scalar and c was a constant then you would immediately say that the solution of this differential equation is y is some constant times e to the minus Uh, ct okay so that would be your answer so if this was a scalar this was a constant so suppose suppose we had dy by dt or i'll say just to differentiate with 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 that y i'll say dx by dt equal to ax okay then to solve this you'll get x is equal to e to the at some times some constant so i'll just say a e to the at okay so that would be the solution right now uh, here here you don't have uh, you don't have the luxury of having these as scalars these are vectors okay and uh, you don't know and so this is a two dimensional vector okay now uh, we cannot we cannot use this technique but uh, there is a way of you but uh, what we'll say is that we'll guess that y is equal to some matrix uh, i'll just call it a matrix that is independent of time so y is a matrix that depends on time e to the lambda t okay so 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 this is a matrix a okay so this is a matrix or sorry sorry this should be a vector a e to the lambda t vector and it is independent of time okay 
okay so 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 let's use this as a trial solution okay and uh, and what we'll do is try to find out what is what does a what do a and lambda represent with respect to this matrix c okay so suppose i take this and substitute it here then uh, dy by dt is equal to now a is independent of time so i can just write this as a lambda e to the lambda t okay and if i substitute here for y then i will get uh, this should be equal to c a e to the lambda t so then that uh, since lambda is just a scalar i can bring it in front e to the lambda t is a, is a scalar which can cancel on both sides so i'll get c this implies c times a is equal to lambda times a okay c is a matrix a is a vector lambda is a scalar okay so this is an eigen value equation So, when you make this trial solution, okay, you, what you find is that lambda sh 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 should be an eigenvalue of c okay, and the eigenvector should be a. Okay, so, suppose you know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this, of this uh, matrix c, then you know the solutions. c was our matrix. So, if you know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, then you can write the solution. Okay. Now, this will have two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors in general. In general, uh, 2 by 2 matrix will have two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors and so, and so what you get is you will get two solutions. So, the result is two solutions. Okay, so we call them uh, two eigenvalues. If you call them, if you denote them as lambda one and lambda two, and this as a one and a two, okay. then the two solutions will have the form y one is equal to a one, or uh, I'll just say y one is a one e to the lambda one t and y the second solution of y is a2 e to the lambda 2t okay so uh, now the question is which of these is a solution is one of these a solution or uh, or should we do something else the answer lies that uh, in the fact that uh, your general solution is y is equal to some constant, I will call it uh, d 1, d 1 times the first solution. So, d 1 times a 1 e to the lambda 1 t. Okay, so, some constant multiplied by the first solution plus some other constant multiplied by the second solution. So, this is a general solution. So, so, so it is a general solution. So, it has two undetermined constants d 1 and d 2 okay. and uh, this is the way you write the general solution and if you want uh, for particular solution we need boundary conditions okay so we, so you need two boundary conditions because your y was a 2 by 2 matrix okay so, so in, since y was a 2 by 2 matrix you need two boundary conditions and that will give you the particular solution okay so 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 by by finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix you can solve this this differential equation 
So, the way to solve this differential equation is to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. Once you have the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, then you can write down a general solution. Okay? And uh, we had two undetermined constants because, because you had uh, two coupled first order differential equations. If you had if you had more differential equations, you would have had you would have had this would have been a larger matrix, and you would have had more undetermined constants. Okay, so so uh, in the in the next class, we will see an application of this uh, this method uh, this uh, system of uh, first order differential equations. The application is something uh, many of you will be familiar with, but uh, we'll just cast it in the form of this uh, differential equations and solution, uh, and that and the application will be will be talking about will be taken from reaction kinetics when you have a when you have in a in any reactive system you have many reactions taking place and uh, and uh, the product of one reaction will be related to the reactants of the next reaction and so and so you have a set of coupled re reactions and each of them has its own differential equations and under certain conditions you get a set of coupled first order differential equations so we look at an example of how to solve that using this technique